Welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, everybody. I am really excited for today's conversation with my guest, Yaki Cahoon. We've been kind of following each other around um, the social media world for a while, and they posted something a couple months ago over on TikTok that just had me like, I really need to bring Yaki on to the Empathic Mastery Show. So Yaki Cahoon is a trauma survivor, both from an unusual religious upbringing, which we're going to go into, and military time in military service. They now serve as an interfaith chaplain to hospice patients and parents with ongoing trauma from unconstitutional orders from the courts. And if you have ever had the experience of unconstitutional orders from the courts, I'm sure that this is going to be a powerful, powerful conversation. Yaki, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. I've also followed some of your your videos and listened to many of the podcasts, and I find them enlightening. I find them very helpful and affirming to me. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean, for me, there's nothing that's more important than the true, true. Like, just really, like, let's get real here. (laughs) We've spent so many years pretending that everything's okay, but let's have a real conversation. So, with that said, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with, like, you know, what was life like for you as a very young person? What was your experience and unusual religious upbringing? I mean, that's a mouthful. First of all, um, I have to say that my upbringing was nurturing and physically safe. And coming only six months after the death of my mother, I want to be sure that I introduce anything I say honoring her memory as a very good mom. And she always was. There were very few times when she lost her temper. There was no violence. There was no fighting. In fact, if we did, she would correct that. She did not allow hitting or hurting anyone. And I'm so grateful that I had that kind of upbringing. It was unusual because it was a kind of a quasi separatist sect of fundamentalism. Um, And I didn't realize at the time that it was so unusual because I saw very little outside of my parents' religion. Um, A part of keeping that type of thought process alive is really restricting exposure to anything that is different. Were you homeschooled? Uh, I actually was for the last uh, five years, the preceding however many years from kindergarten to about seventh or eighth grade. I um. I was in small Christian schools that mm-hmm. were basically an annex of my parents' home. You know, there were other students there. It was usually, it was always at the church. And my dad was the administrator. <laughs> my mother taught kindergarten. So everyone in my family has four letters in our name. And there will be no more than two syllables because she taught kindergarten. And we must all be able to write and say our names clearly. <laughs> Yucky, there's so much that you're already saying that feels so significant to me. For one thing, I really want to hold something up because so many people associate or assume if you identify as a trauma survivor, it's because of your parents. And, you know, like it's almost as if the only kind of real trauma is is the trauma that we experience with our parents. And I think that I love that you are acknowledging right off the bat that your childhood, because this is actually was my experience as well. My parents were perfectly good parents. I was safe. I was nurtured. My -hmm. experience, my trauma had a lot more to do with the fact that I was, I was not like any of the other children and I did not fit into a world that didn't understand me. 
And so I love that you are acknowledging that your mom was a really good mom and that you were safe and your needs were getting met. And at the same time, you endured trauma. Like that to me is just such an important thing to acknowledge because I think so often people, well, and then also we have what I call the trauma Olympics where you know it's like the people who are like dishing out like they're like you only get like a bronze medal for your trauma because i'm the one with the gold medal so i just really wanted to hold that up and say thank you so much for clarifying that and acknowledging that your your childhood your parent your your mother was a wonderful person yes and my and my dad was too he was not yeah. there was no violence in my background i grew up graduated through a high school homeschool. I went to a, a four-year undergrad experience institute. They called it college, but I've since learned you can't really just open a building and call it a college. You have to go through certain steps. Um, yeah. actually be yeah, isn't college. that funny the way that works? <laughs> like there's actually <laughs> criteria. Yeah. Um, so I get through with four years of this program. And the academics were stellar. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, it, it was hard and it took work and effort. And I graduated what they called cum laude. So I know that my parents' uh, education background prepared me well for the academics of a world I knew nothing of. Well, hmm. I went from that world to Thailand because I knew even as a young adult, that I was not like them. I was not like their religion. I didn't understand it. It didn't seem consistent. So I, I had always had this love for the Orient and left to go on some volunteer work for six months. I was working in an international dormitory as a dorm parent. Um, I loved that. Well, while I was there, I met the, the students' parents and the work that they did. And I ended up being there for two years and then went back later. And it became a crucial part of my development. I was in my early to mid 20s. And that is when I grew up. That's when I went through adolescence. That's when I learned to make decisions. Because I would go into a, a food shop and be overwhelmed by the number of choices because I had never been given a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. So it's a place where I began to see religion outside of my parents' perspective. I had never before seen that. And I thought, wow, these people are wearing clothes that I was told was sinful. These people are, are listening to music that is supposedly carnal, but they really love God. And they are safe, nurturing, kind people. I want more like this. And that was a bit of the very beginning for me understanding that what I had seen growing up, what my supposed normal was, was far from normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things that you are saying that I think is so important, and I've noticed this in so much of the work that I do with people when we start unpacking our childhoods and unpacking our belief systems, is how whatever it is that we were raised in, we assume it's normal until we have a contrast to it, until we have the exposure to a different way of living and go, wait a second, that's completely different than what I experienced. So, I mean, what an amazing thing. Like, how did you decide to go to Thailand? Like, what a, from, from this very, very insulated, protective, uh, you know, fundamentalist Christian background where you're like you spend all your time homeschooled or in the little red schoolhouse to I'm going to Thailand like how did you even like what was it that got like like what angel you know got you going to Thailand like even that like that must have taken so much courage I had done my student teaching in China a couple of years before and I, as I said, I always had a love for the Orient from being a child. My parents encouraged reading, and we did voraciously read one book after the other because that was our TV. You know, that was our playtime to us. Not doing chores or schoolwork, you know, was playtime. And for us, playtime was reading a book. Now, it was often, uh, you know, in a treehouse, climbing up a tree, sitting around reading a book. 
uh, loved nature even as a child. Um, and so I just always had this love for the Orient. And so I ended up in Thailand because it was it was safe enough to be with a Christian mission organization, according, you know, trying to get my parents to, you know, let me do this. Again, I was 22 years old. So that gives you a little bit of concept to that mentality at that, even at that age, I was waiting for my parents to let me. Yeah. Um, and so uh, once I was there, I began to understand religions, both Christianity and other religions outside of their perspective. And I realized that what they were was a type of fundamentalist. So I started doing reading on that word that I'd never really heard a lot about. But that's how other people were helping me understand why I was so different from everyone else, not because I was in Thailand, but because everyone else around me was American. And they didn't understand why I didn't understand. I didn't know their movies. I didn't know their music. Um, so I did a lot of study on what that word meant and came to the realization that it was American, it was Protestant, it was late 20th century, and none of that had anything to do with the idea of Christianity, right. which is a much older religion. I met Catholics who were Christians. I met Buddhists who, Buddhist monks taught me most of my Thai language back then. I met Buddhists who were beyond the most God-fearing, most wonderful people that I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Sacrificial beyond anything I've ever seen before. And that word sacrifice is very important in my upbringing because that's how they, that mentality proceeds. It's how it maintains. It allows people to think that we're living this way as a sacrifice to God. So Buddhists understand that word. And I was able to really take familiar concepts and new words that I was learning, even from other Americans, and put them into a very developing, untitled interface thought process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, and so what I'm hearing, um, I'm uh, sort of extrapolating from what you said, that mission work is kind of what kind of gave you the door or opened the door for you to Thailand and probably China as well. So that mm -hmm. that was kind of and it, I, I love kind of the God's sense of humor in all of this, that you going to do mission work is the thing that completely turned your relationship with God and especially your relationship with your religion on its head. Like there's Absolutely. something kind of po poetic about that. I totally agree with you. Um, and now I, I will bring in to my own religious practice and my own spiritual walk is a Judeo-Christian Buddhist foundation, because that's what I saw. And that's what I want. I want everything from everyone that is good. Yes. Because scripture actually says that all good things come from above. Yes. Yes. And well, and I, I was raised um, as a universalist. Well, as I was raised as a Unitarian Universalist. And so but I identify much more as a universalist in the sense of all people are saved in God's love. Like that's then that's really the core tenet of universalism is all people are saved in God's love right there with you with, when it, the ideas of interfaith. So you're in Thailand. How did you go from this? expansive understanding new way of looking at the world to deciding to become to join the military well yeah. so i um I, I guess you could say i've just always been a very hyperactive human being uh, i've spent a lot of time uh thinking and i i need to think and i need to do these are very important concepts to me so my sister was getting married and my mother said i had to come back to the states for the wedding which i regret doing not because it wasn't a good relationship. They've been married for 15 years. They have three beautiful children. It's a good, happy home life. And they keep their commitment, which is very important in my family. Um, so I came back to the States and you know, I was like, what do I do? Like, who am I? Where do I fit in? Because I'm not a part of this world anymore. And yet I'm sitting here in my parents' home. So, you know, I got a job and I, I, I tried to get a master's degree to realize I didn't actually have a bachelor's degree mm. um, that was a that was a big slap in the face to start realizing that I didn't have a bachelor's degree I didn't have a high school diploma 
um, I got a job and it was a good job. And I worked um, at a law firm for several years and it was, you know, uh, reception, running errands, that types of things. And it was a good, good job. But I was bored. Yeah. I was really bored. And uh, I had some uncles who were in the military, so I wasn't completely adverse to the concept. It wasn't new to me. And if you know anything about evangelicals, you know, their whole concept of God, guns, and country is pretty strong, especially yes. in some regions of this country. Mm -hmm. um, long story short, I, I joined the military and I said, I, I want to study languages. Uh, at the time, I thought that I was really good at it because in less than two years, I had actually learned Thai and I'd done really good with it. So they, um, uh, you know, I talked to several different branches and ended up signing up with the Air Force because they really liked my ASVAB scores. That's the language battery. Uh, went off to boot camp, went off to language school. It was really good. Um, and then I got transferred to Texas, moment of silence, because I don't like Texas, just generally speaking. It's very hot. And yes. unless you're in one of the three actual cities like Austin or, you know, places where things actually happen in their civilization. There's nothing there. So here I am in a job that at that point was not related to linguistics. And I was bored out of my mind. And I was in a very dangerous situation. That time of, you know, trying to figure out who I was post Thailand. And until I got to Texas, was discovering things about sexual theology that I had been taught that were really unhealthy, you know, like being 26 or 27 years old and not knowing much, if anything, about mm -hmm. sexuality. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. It is dangerous. That's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Long story short, um, I had a slew of boyfriends, had a lot of sex, lots of fun. And the last one is actually the one who asked me, do you think you might be gay? Well, I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he, he taught me what that was. And he was right. He was, he was absolutely right. So from that point forward, I was done with men. And then I was in the military. And that was in, during the era of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh -huh. so, tell you that I was not in a safe situation when I was at a, an air base in Texas. What I mean was that I lived in a laundromat because I could not go back to post without fear and harassment and threats. Long story short, I got discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm. Everything that I had, I thought it was a good idea. You know, I'm going to go off and, and be the God guns and glory hero in uniform. And they took it away from me. Wow. And I, nothing. So. Well, and you during, went into go for language and to be, I imagine, like a linguistic specialist. And you end up in Texas with what I'm imagining is kind of a grunt job doing something that is completely unrelated to what you were supposed to be used for. Like, right. how different would your reality have been if they sent you to Berlin? <laughs> you know, like if you had ended up or or Amsterdam or, you know, but like if if you had gone, if they'd sent you someplace to someplace else and you got to use one of your God given gifts for language. Yeah. Or they I sent agree. you back to Thailand for that matter. <laughs> well, at that point, and even to this day, Thailand doesn't have a, an American base. So we, we're yeah. while they are considered allies, we don't really have a post to actually be stationed there. But I do agree with you. I think a lot of that came out of out of a lot of disappointment, promises made by recruiters that didn't play out and yeah. mistakes that I made because I did not understand the culture around me, both because it was a military culture that I didn't grow up in and because it was American. Yes. And I didn't know that culture. I didn't have yes. it because I didn't know, I didn't have anything in common with these people. I was a foreign exchange student in my own cult country. Yes. I was a foreign exchange student in my own country's military service. Mm. Well, and I think, you know, you speak about culture and you speak about the two cultures, American culture, but also military culture. And that's one thing. One of the reasons why I personally am really clear that unless there was no other option, I, as an EFT practitioner, do not put my shingle up for working with veterans 
because I do not have a relationship with military culture. And I understand that not understanding military culture is an absolute liability when it comes to participating in and supporting people within military culture. And so I know from what I know, I'm just like, I know that's a whole other language I don't even know. And here you are walking into two different languages that you do not know. Yes. Trying to sort your, find your way. And I'm imagining simultaneously being in that really early stage of coming out and navigating or trying to figure out what your sexuality really means to you, who you are. I mean, at that point, we didn't really have anybody talking about gender expression. So perhaps you were spared that question, but I can only imagine you're in this you're a stranger in a strange land with all of this weird lack of like your no common language and trying to and and simultaneously who am i what am i doing why am i here i can't even imagine hmm. so while i'm living in this laundromat and people had to have known i was there and i realized that now but at the time i was in such a fear factor that I didn't catch on that food being left was not accidental. And I would fold people's laundry because again, I think and I do and I think best when I'm doing so I just fold everybody's laundry, they started leaving more laundry, I would fold more laundry than they started leaving money. Then someone came in, in the middle of the night one time. You know, I'm hiding because I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not supposed to be there. And they just stood in the middle of the room and they said, I know you're here. I know that you're safe. I'll be here Sunday morning at 930 if you want to ride to church with me. It is an open and affirming congregation. That means it's okay for you to be gay. They turned around and walked out. I do not know to this day if that was a human or an angel. I assume it was human because there was a person there at 930 on Sunday. I got in the car. They introduced themselves and we went to church. And that was the beginning of being introduced to gay Christianity. And from that point forward, I was safe. I went through more trauma in the military. I went through more trauma later that indicates some systemic abuse happens on many facets of American culture. But I was still safe from that point forward. Though I don't really identify as a Christian anymore, I do still hold to a lot of those very strong um ideas and, and beliefs and scriptures that are very, very important to me. And it came out of one person being willing to just come in and make an invitation. And they showed up not knowing if I was going to be there. Mm, that just literally made me cry. So I spent a lot of time uh, with a new friend that I made at that church. And their name's Drew, uh, took me in, let me stay. And they gave me rides to and from post. They, you know, they knew something was going on, but they didn't, um, they never really asked, they never pried. They just said, you know, you're safe. Let me know what I can do. And we're always there. And it's still a good friend of mine to this day. I would say before that season of my life in my late twenties, there are a few, if any friends, there are acquaintances, there are people I knew, but I really don't have a lot of friends from before that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But Drew was one of my oldest friends on the face of the planet. Because it was someone who recognized that what I needed more than anything was a safe place to stay and somebody to talk to and hang out with. And, and so we did. And then Drew's a friend of mine to this day. God bless you, Drew. I'm so <laughs> glad that you showed up when you did. You made, you made a comment earlier about, about how we're, we're trying to be advocates for people whom the system has failed. Yes. You know, I believe that my parents in, I had a beautiful childhood. I realized going to the Institute for four years that even my parents were in many ways better than most. Even in that culture, there were a lot of college aged students whose parents were separated and they didn't know where they were going to go for Christmas. Right. Break. Like, like, how do you choose between your parents when you're like 19, 20 years old? Mm hmm to go home but where is home when they're completely across town from each other there's two of them it's it's really hard so i know 
growing up, I had so many more advantages than most people did. And I think what happened in many ways is once I got out of that, because I had come to a more religious understanding and enlightenment, that I really in some ways left a utopia. That doesn't mean it was perfect, but it was familiar and it was safe. Yeah, yeah. And I never really learned how to how to fit in. Well, and you said something earlier too, you'd never had to make a whole bunch of choices. You, you know, the overwhelm you experienced walking into the grocery store. And I, it's so striking to me how the, the complexity of American culture and the fact that we're just constantly bombarded and inundated with stuff and things and choices and a million television channels and everything in, it makes sense to me that you had loving, nurturing parents. You had the simplicity of your pleasure was in reading books, which is so much better than so many of the other alternatives that we've got for entertainment now. I mean, reading a book is just like in, expands your mind in a way that like, I'm sure there are people who are going to disagree with me, but like playing video games or like binge watching reality TV just doesn't do the same thing. So it really makes sense that you were in this not necessarily perfect, but you were in this safe bubble. And as you started to discover there was a broader word world outside of there, it's kind of like that. It sounds like that bubble kind of burst. And you really had to figure a lot of stuff out, like very rapidly, very quickly. Yes, yes. So once I got out of the military, I was in a place where most military sexual trauma survivors are 80% more likely to step into a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, you know, I went to follow a relationship that was at that point, just, you know, barely budding. And within a year, we were married, quote unquote in one of the three states that allowed gay people to get married. And um, we lived in an area where it wasn't recognized. And I was a foster parent for many, many years. I didn't have much, I didn't have education to speak of. I didn't have much job skill. um, Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but not a whole lot of military jobs are going to prepare you for civilian life. (laughs) Some do, okay, but not a lot. Um, especially marine snipers, like there's there's just not a market for that in in American culture, um, not legally anyway. Mm-hmm. So that sounds fast- like a whole other avenue. <laughs> that one, not legally anyway. <laughs> we won't go down that rabbit hole, but that that was a very interesting comment. <laughs> so we are, um, you know, I I had fallen into what I said I would never do. I never wanted a white picket fence life where I was dependent on some preacher man uh, to keep my life going while I took care of the babies. Like I, that's all I had seen. And I didn't want that, but that's exactly where I ended up. I ended up a hundred percent dependent on this other person. Um, adopted two kids was manipulated into having a child. And by the time that child was two years old, I had been thrown out and it just got worse from there. Mm. So the reason, the reason that I work as a chaplain, an interfaith chaplain with parents surviving alienation and erasure and targeting by these systems is because I know what that feels like. And I learned early on how abusive a government can be when they're trying to hold on to their privilege and power. Well, even your, 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 you commented earlier about having a bachelor's degree. You think you have a bachelor's degree. You spend four years getting all this education. You're doing your due diligence. You're putting in all this effort and everything. What an incredible sense of betrayal that must have been to suddenly have sort of essentially like the powers that be or the authorities say, sorry, kid, but you don't have what it takes. Like, I, I, I was thinking about that. I was wondering, like, growing up in a family, in a system where your education is not considered legitimate, how that would inform this, this 
advocacy for people who are not being regarded or seen as within the parameters of acceptable behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And 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 that's part of the that's part of I I feel like that's part of the problem with American culture as a whole is we think that the way that we do things is the way that it's supposed to be done. Yes. That's how I grew up. That's all I ever saw. So I did not know until I was a young adult that anything else even existed. If I ever accidentally was what you saw something from outside of that religious spectrum, it was a sin. It was wrong. It was carnal. It was, you know, the Englisher's way of life. It was, it was strange to grow up being taught that I was in some ways better than everyone else simply because of my religion. Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. It wasn't actually my religion. It was, it was my parents' religion. Right. I was right. A child. right. <laughs> then you get up into, in the military, that is a conformity culture. You will wear this, you will stand this way, you will do this. I was actually very good at that. Yes. Because I learned as a young child to follow directions. I was very good at that. And to this day, I can teach you how to march. I can do that for days. But how do you take off the uniform and interact with people who are supposedly your peers when we have nothing in common? Because mm-hmm. we live this land but in completely different societies, completely different cultures. And then you come into um, a situation that I was in with so much coercive control, including coerced and controlled out of my own housing. And I'm standing in front of a judge. I still have this mentality that the authorities are in charge, that the authorities are there to help and to serve and to do the right thing. And yet that is not the case. That is what I learned is that this idea of conformity comes in in such a negative way. You will conform right now. You will triple your income. You will become someone I respect as if I were the judge. I'm speaking in such a way that everyone has to be exactly the same. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it's slightly different, whether that be for income or gender or for heaven's sakes, the color of your shirt. Well, now you don't belong. And you don't deserve the civil rights that you know you were born into. I don't know if you saw this. There is a documentary, a documentary on Netflix that's called something like Please Take Care of Maya. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It is um, about a mother who's it's a child who has a great deal of med, of of like unexplainable, weird health issues. Um, where the treatment was something that the conventional doctors did not agree with. And um, it's just this absolute horror story where the mother who was advocating for her daughter, the court and the system went completely against her. And to the point where sadly, I'll give you a spoiler alert, the mother suicided. And so the father and these and his two children, including Maya, did this documentary. And what came out of it was the amazing epidemic of parents who get accused of abuse for children who have health, unexplainable health issues, and who end up even parents end up in jail, but lose all their parental rights because a hospital system sees a child once and determines that the kid must be being abused because of this issue. And it was such an eye-opening experience for me because I, like you, was raised to believe that the authorities had our best interest in heart and that, you know, the court system will sort out the good guy from the bad guy. And that if you're good, if you're righteous, if you're standing on the right side of things, that the judge is going to recognize that, that the system is going to recognize that and everything is going to work out. But it's it's amazing how frequently, it almost seems like it's a language barrier thing in the sense that if somebody's not part of assimilated into the rules of American culture, that it's very, very easy to fall through the cracks or be regarded as an outlier and then lose privilege. That's that's. A fantastic summation. I've not seen that film. I'm glad you mentioned it to me. I noticed that there was a high suicide rate 
and high addictions rate in the parents who had been through the same and even worse scenarios than I had been. And that is when I really began to heal, was to recognize that I was not the only one. I, I learned that there are other people who have survived even worse situations of fundamentalism than I did. They did not have a safe home life, even though it looked that when they got to church, everything was, was put on a, a great front. They were homeschooled and they followed all the, the fundy rules, but they were not safe. And, and there are mm-hmm. others who survived military trauma as I did, who whose situation was far worse than mine. Yeah. And here I am in this in this other stage in my life where I'm like, how is it that I keep going through all of these weird things? And yet it's not as horrible as so many other people. And that's when I started studying the concept of empathy. Mm-hmm. Because I realized that first and foremost, what I needed was empathy for my own self. Mm-hmm. And that goes beyond self-care. That goes into self-respect. It was, it was allowing the new me, the new traumatized self to be just as I am, not trying to improve, not trying to change too much too fast, and definitely not trying to conform to what somebody else says is normal. I had to learn to cultivate empathy for myself. Mm. Brene, Brene Brown said, empathy is simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message of you are not alone. Mm. I'm not alone. I'm not the only person who's come through fundamentalism and is now a flaming gay. Fabulous. And I'm not the only fabulous. <laughs> and I'm not the only person who's come through the military under don't ask, don't tell. And it took me 10 years, more than 10 years to even get recognized as a veteran because they had done so much damage to my paperwork. Oh my that God. I was, wasn't even a veteran for over a decade. Mm, mm. And I had to learn to cultivate empathy for myself because I spent over a decade thinking I was a criminal because that's how they treated me. Mm. And that's what the courts did over and over. I did it again. They took something innocent and beautiful and wonderful that is sacred and should be protected. And they turned it into a crime. Mm. I am, on behalf of our country, I am so sorry. I just, oh, it just the, the thing. And, and I love that you are acknowledging that you are not alone in this, that you, that you know that this is not exclusive to you. And simultaneously that you are giving yourself empathy for all of this, because I mean, what a journey. So how did you, how did you go from this period of loss and being rudderless? Like, I mean, I'm imagining like you're cast adrift. How did you, sh- like, what led you to the work you do now? Well, a lot of it comes back to that nurturing academic childhood. I turned to books. I turned to studies. I, in, you know, in that era when my children, including my own two-year-old biological child, don't have a mother in our home because somebody else just decided not to allow me there anymore. Mm. So- recognized that I had a gift and said, you know, you should try this school. So I applied to that school. And then I applied to another school and I went to this. In the end of a 16 year pursuit, I actually ended up with a master's of divinity because that's where my giftedness lies. That I understood Hebrew Bible. I understood Greek scriptures to the extent that I could even get into an academic program without having what everyone else thought was expected, what was normal. Um, and so that's just some of those beautiful little miracles that happened in my life. Yeah. And I learned all about those prophets in the Hebrew Bible that went through hell on earth. And one of them said, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything I've gone through is something that others have gone through. So in addition to cultivating empathy for myself, 
I had to learn to empathize with others. In um, recently, I finished reviewing the 12 steps of AA mm-hmm. in consideration of, of surviving parents. Mm. And help step, it points out that healing comes from helping and serving others. Exactly. Spreading the message. And that took me back to being a young adult, uh, learning Thai from Buddhist monks who spent their life serving others. Yeah. To the extent that they didn't have money, they would go out in the morning with their pot and everyone in the, in the neighborhood would feed them. They would give them a day's amount of food. And if they ended up back at the Wat, the Wat the temple, if they ended up back at the Buddhist temple with more than they needed for a day, they would cook it and they would open the doors and anyone who needed food would come in. So the service given to them became the service given to others. Empathy is internal first, but it has to come out externally. It has to be seen. And I had to learn to empathize with others and what they needed and what they felt and what they saw. I think that I may, that this is something said in the 12 step program, you you know, it's like, you got to give it away to keep it. And Mm -hmm. that, you know, what I really love you that you're talking about, and in many ways, like even in terms of like degrees of initiation in terms of spiritual path, you know, like within, within the Wiccan path, there's like the first degree, the second degree and the third degree. And What's interesting is like the first degree is you just learn it. The second degree, you learn to facilitate it. The third degree, you learn to give it away and and empower other people to do it. And a lot of people get stuck in that second degree, that place of wearing the big foo-foo hat and looking like the authority and like getting all the kudos and the accolades. But in order to really perpetuate it and also for us to thrive, we need to be willing to be willing to be of service and to surrender the ego and like allow it to happen. And I think as a culture right now, there's so much, we're so focused on the self care and the returning to ourselves and the and cultivating empathy for ourselves that I think a lot of times we don't get to that next step, which is the 12th step, which is the in order to, we've got to give it away to keep it. So I love this, this journey of empathy for you, where it started with that self empathy, but then you realize, no, in order to keep this, in order to be able to thrive, I have to give this back out to the world. I think that that next step is actually easier than the one that follows. I had to cultivate empathy for myself, I had to learn to empathize with others. But what I'm working on right now, and I'm telling you, I get a lot of flack for this one, is I'm trying to have empathy for my abusers. Because no one wakes up and Mm-mm. becomes a big judge overnight. No other government agents, they don't sign up for a BA in abusing law-abiding citizens. Like, that doesn't exist, okay? No, no. There was temptation and pressure that led up to where they're at. And I dare say they likely have some unresolved trauma in their own lives. Like because hurt, <laughs> hurt people hurt other people. Yes. 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 So I'm stage right now and I am definitely not going to say I've mastered it where I'm trying to have empathy for the people who have abused me. What kind of a, a military official would think it was acceptable to treat me the way that I was treated. Something was wrong. Something, Something was, was wrong. Really wrong. What kind of, of human being comes out of a dysfunctional family, marries into a family like mine, saying that they want to redeem their family name. And by the time my, my bio daughter is two, not even, is just two years old, throwing the mother out of the house, how do you get from, st- mm. from one to the other? Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Ugh. It was Hannah Arendt who said, the death of human empathy is one of the earliest and most telling signs of a culture about to fall into barbarism. Yeah. And I think that is where we're at societally. We're so concerned about everyone being in a uniform and looking like everyone else 
acting like everyone else, making as much money as everyone else, having as many things, these possessions as everyone else, that we forget to have an empathy for the people who don't have all that. Yes. Or we look at them as losers. We blame them. I mean, there is so, there are just, well, and also the way that right now there is such a wedge being driven between people in our country and so much dehumanizing that is going on with people who are in different places. And I think sadly, the pandemic really drove people like instead of bringing a lot of us together, there was a way in which the pandemic really uh, heightened the tension in our culture even more. I love how you are just really speaking to having that compassion and having that empathy for the perpetrator, for the abuser. I had an experience many years ago back when a former and not our, not the previous former Republican president, but a former Republican president like ages ago where I was meditating And because what I would do is instead of feel whenever hatred would come up inside of me for some of the things that this person was doing that I just just like this is wrong, I would pray for them. And one morning I was I had woken up at dawn and I was in a pray I was meditating with some other people and I tuned into him and I all of a sudden just had this experience of being aware that he was sitting on the toilet He had just been awakened by his handlers and he was sitting on the toilet and he was having one of the very few minutes in his entire day where he was alone. And Mm. I just had this sense of like how absolutely inundated, constantly barraged with everybody Mm. asking questions and everybody on top of him and everything and all the pressure. And I was sort of like, would I, would I be able to handle this with any more grace? Like, And I think sometimes like when we really can not let somebody off the hook for their bad behavior, but have empathy for how they got to that bad behavior, there's something so freeing about that. So Mm. I, I love that you are speaking to that where you're like, you know, people do not become like power hungry judges who are just destroying people's lives just for the hell of it. No. And I mean, I don't want to get too political. Yet I think that a lot of what we're seeing now is a trickle down effect. This is generations of this behavior. Our country was is founded on stolen land. Yes. Our buildings well, and are stolen labor. You go into you go you want to go even further back. We are the product of European genocide. We are the trauma survivors who lost our own indigenous traditions and religions, which is one of the reasons why I think so many people feel safer going into Buddhism or yoga or Native American spirituality because witchcraft is terrifying because that but that's ours. That's what our ancestors believed. And the amount of women and children that were annihilated in Europe in the middle ages is absolutely like earth shattering. We have never dealt with the trauma from that experience. And we've been kicking this can of trauma down the road. I mean, I think in some places and in some ways for thousands of years, but you know, we've been kicking this can of trauma for such a long time and it's all come home to roost right now. It's like, Da-da, here it all is. 500 years of racism, five, you know, thousands of years of patriarchy and sexism. Like, <laughs> don't get me started. So I wish that I wish that my wife Olivia was hearing what you're saying right now. Um, because she's spoken in similar ways because she is a natural person and like an animus type person with the ancestor altar and she grows all these weeds out in the, I call them weeds. She grows all these green things in the yard. And if you have an ailment. She grows she medicine can, in the yard. <laughs> yeah. She can tell you how to fix it with some kind of tea. It tastes like, yeah. tastes bad. 
Yeah. As my husband used to say, it tastes like dirt. <laughs> I, tra- I taught him how to say, not for me. <laughs> it's like, and you talked about this re- not too long ago about how if she were living in another time and another era, they would kill her yeah. because she has this knowledge. Yeah. Because she's not like everybody else. She must die. Yeah. And she would be hunted. It's crazy. It is crazy. I believe that, I know I made a statement earlier that hurt people hurt other people. Exactly. But I also believe that healing people can help people heal. Yes. And that, that's what empathy does. Yes. When I first met Olivia, I was so broken and so hurting because my children were in between two different court nappings. The first mm-hmm. time they were, they were moved seven hours away from me. The second time they were moved five hours away from me. Because I don't matter. I don't have civil rights because I don't have the money to buy an attorney with more rank and more volume than the other one. When I met Olivia, I was so broken. I almost didn't date her because she has a young child. I didn't want any more in my life. I didn't want anything to do with that. And yet now he's like my, my best friend. You know? He's the coolest little four and a half year old. And he's smart and he is helping me heal. But I, I, what I needed was to start healing. And she helped me do that. So I've stopped and I thought, you know, how do we do this? How do we cultivate empathy for ourselves? How do we cultivate empathy with others? And I think there's two really important steps. The first one is we recognize the humanity in everyone. Everyone is perfect. When I was telling my story to Olivia, she asked questions that nobody else asked. She didn't just hear my side of the story and affirm it. She did that. But then she asked questions about the other person. Mm. Or doing, And she made me aware of the fact that the people who abused me are human beings. There is no power on top forever. Our species is capable of benevolence and humanness, even if it's one-sided. We're capable of recognizing the humanity in everyone. Yes. 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 Yucky, I cannot believe. I always say this and I always mean it. I cannot believe how fast this conversation has gone by and that we have gotten to that point where it's like we're we're circling in on the top of the hour. So Olivia, let me let me finish yeah. this. Olivia grew up in Japan. So we're both came to our personalities in Asia. Mm. And she loves the mountains. I love the mountains. So there's just a lot that brought us together. Yeah. But this is something else I've learned from her. And this is the second step in how we can work on this empathy. We have to refuse to take an eye for an eye. If we are walking around one-eyed, trying to take vengeance on everybody who's wounded us, we will most likely cause ourselves more harm than we could ever cause to our abusers. Cruelty begets cruelty. I am not saying that we ought not seek justice or the idea of justice as it's allowed in our man-made society. I'm saying we ought to, we ought not to seek to get even or to cause harm to anyone, even those who have harmed us. Mm. Preach, preach. (laughs) Mohsin Hamid said, empathy is about finding echoes of another person in yourself. That's my parents echoing in me from my childhood. That's military people echoing inside of me. That's my children echoing from hours and hours and hours away. Yeah. That's even my abusers echoing their own trauma into my story. Yes. That's empathy. That's empathy. Anything else that you would be like, I'm going to kick myself if I don't say this? No, because I, I have notes in front of me. <laughs> Go you. Yeah. So I'm making sure that as you prompt me to tell stories and answer questions while I'm going down this list, and I'm done. And that's fantastic. Okay, so then since you've, you know, I know you're familiar with the show, so you know what comes next, which is the time travel part. So because I do sincerely believe that podcasts exist outside of time. They extend in perpetuity. This will be listened to many years from now. But I also believe we have this ability to broadcast back in time to another part of ourself. 
And mm. so I always love to take a moment to give us a chance to send a message back to the part of us that really needs to hear a message. So mm. who are we sending a message back to? What age is, are they? What do they need to hear? I think it's to myself, if I may be so conceited as to speak to myself. Well, yeah, you're speaking to yourself. I'm just saying, what age are you? Um, I'm that young adult leaving a protected environment and entering a world where even authorities and systems fail. Yeah. And what do they need to hear? It is okay that you are weird. You can be different. You don't have to try to be like everyone else because that's not who you are. And if you learn who you are and stick to that, you will be happier than everyone around you. Mm. It's okay to be weird. Yeah, I mean, this conversation has been so rich, so good, and just such a reminder. Come in, like it. This is my passion. Like this is. This is the message that I want left when I'm not here anymore. Yeah. I want them to say that that Yaki tried. Yeah, Yaki tried. Well, and I really, I just really, really appreciate you being an advocate for empathy and how incredibly important it is for all of us to work on cultivating it. And I will say that ironically, sometimes empaths, I think, because we get so bogged down by trying to process all the things that come through, we can lose empathy. We can lose that perspective because we're just so distracted by the empathic overwhelm. And yet the antidote is empathy. Mm. Last question. How do people get in touch with you? I'm on most of the social media platforms as at Teriyaki Kahoon. You can use some hashtags like Erased Moms Chaplain or Protective Parents Chaplain. I'm going to start another TikTok study, hopefully in September. And it's going to be another like trauma focus, uh, a bit of support group and a lot of academia. I'm just taking what my the seeds of reading that my parents planted in me. And I'm going to finish up my doctorate of ministry in spiritual counseling next year. I'm working on my dissertation, which is a spiritual care guide for these parents. How do oh. chaplains and clergy deal with this when they don't know anything about it? That's what I want to do. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Amazing. And what a good use of your demon, like, studies. like. What a good use to create something that will be usable and helpful and valuable for people. And yeah. my email is yaki plus three at gmail.com, which is also the title of my book on Amazon. It's called Yaki plus three. Wonderful. So we got it. It is a, a lot more sadness that I just told you. And the next one I'm hoping to get out soon. And it is the second part of the story with a whole lot more of this in it, the lessons that I've learned and the concepts that I've tried to develop, practice, live by and die for. Mm, mm, mm. Well, we will, I would love when you're ready for the launch of that next book, I would love to bring you, bring you back to either this show and or like, doing some, t- you know, like maybe we can do a TikTok live or a Facebook live. And I would love to help you to get the spread the word and get this book out into the world, because this is a message people need to hear. Yaki, thank you so much for being part of this conversation and for just sharing your love and your light and your empathy and your hope with us. In Thai, we would say sabai sabai, which is kind of a Hello and a goodbye, and also a way of saying it's well. All is good. So bye, so bye. So bye, so bye. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to empathicmasteryshow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. 
And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery show airs. Okay, one last time. Hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.